this uh, seminar in digital candidates at the University of Western Sydney. It's fantastic to have a visitor here all the way from Canada. Um, I'd like to particularly uh, welcome you to this uh, university, um, especially since this is in fact the first part of what is a wider uh, Australia-Canada knowledge transfer project which has funding from the Australian Academy of Social Sciences with matching funds from the University of Western Sydney and also from um, the University of Victoria and Canada for Daniels from. So that's a, a great beginning to this collaboration. Uh, I'm not going to give a, a long introduction uh, it's because I think that we'll take the approach that we'll see for a while and actually have a conversation around, around what, what comes up. Um, Suffice to say that uh, Daniel Powell works at the Electronic Textual Cultures Lab at the um, University of Victoria in British Columbia, which is one of the leading institutions for this work in digital humanities in the world and certainly has a great concentration of people and projects uh, that has been led there by uh, Ray Siemens over, over a period of time. But um, also, um, in addition to the work that you're doing towards the PhD uh, project, which you began in 2011, I understand is near completion. Um, you, uh, it's fantastic to read about your work as project manager of the Renaissance English Knowledge Network, or RECN, this major digital infrastructure project, which I'm sure we'll be hearing um, something about, and, and many other activities. So it's, a, it's fantastic to have you here, and also to know that you're going to be presenting at the Digital Humanities Australasia Conference, which is being held next week in Perth. Um, so everybody, please make welcome Daniel Powell. Thanks, Paul. I'm laughing because I'm show you some pictures of the, the lab. And <laughs> after that description, uh, they, they might be surprising to you. Um, in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about how to do it in these microclimates, the politics and pragmatics of place and this is me. Uh, if you'd like to, to check out my Twitter or my sadly collected website, please feel free to take that down. I usually live tweet these things. I haven't quite figured out how to live tweet what I'm presenting yet, but soon. I have been experimenting with timed tweets, but uh, it's a problem for another day. Um, so I'd like to start off by, by thinking and acknowledging some folks. So we always leave this till the end when everyone's hired me to talk, so I like to uh, so thanks to Paul and Jason for hosting me out here, and to the University of Western Sydney for helping to bring me out. And on the other side of the very large Pacific, thanks to uh, the DCL and Ray, and uh, all the teams associated with the lab and the Implementing New Knowledge Environment uh, Project, which is a large project involving about 70 different individuals, and many of whom have bounced these ideas off of in the past. So, and also, as is customary, I'd like to acknowledge the core of my that correct uh, people on whose lands we meet. Uh, that, is, that is a commonality that we share on the West Coast as well. But, um, so yeah, I'm going to begin by, by touching on the fact that these, these discussions, and I really do only hope to talk for around 20 minutes, and then hopefully we can have a discussion about some of the things I'm going to bring up and throw at you guys. Um, this is not the first time I've given or been involved with a talk with this title. Uh, this is from the, the Rocky Mountain Modern Language Association. Uh, it's a regional association associated with MLA. And Ray was asked to keynote last uh, September, so we put a version of this panel together using some folks from the region. Uh, we had Dini Grigar, who's at Washington State University, which is right outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, Paige Morgan, who's a doctoral candidate at the uh, University of Washington in Seattle. And Ray from the University of Victoria, and Roger Woodson, who is a assistant professor at Washington State University, Pullman. And it's actually a very similar Washington State, State system, it's quite similar to the UWS, it sounds like. They have a distributed campus, and their department meetings happen uh, using Skype across the state, uh, which is, sounds terrible to me, but uh, they make it work. And so this is, this is picked up by some of the blogs. This is Digital Humanities Now, um, which is sort of a post-publication aggregator of DH content. Um, Paige, whose name you can kind of see tucked down here, was one of our participants, so she did a really great write-up and sort of recap some of the things we talked about, uh, which was nice. She also was involved with some bottom-up teaching of DH at the University of Washington, so it was really great to have her involved. 
And then we also did a version of this panel at the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities, uh, Society of Canadian Digital Humanities at the Congress of Humanities and Social Sciences, which is a large gathering around 8,000 academics from many different scholarly associations. And that involved these folks, Ray again, uh, Amy Morrison, who's from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, John Bath from the University of Saskatchewan, Gentry Sayers, who actually brings a very media studies and critical making flavor to our, our discussions all the time, and myself. Um, but really, this, just to give you an idea, since I know I love maps and, and everyone's geography might not, might not be uh, able to pinpoint those locations. So we were meeting out here, we had some people from here, some people from Saskatchewan, and some people from Ontario. So if I understand things right, Australia's about this big. So similar, similar levels of flying, but not quite a, a desert in the middle. But we do have to fly around and visit each other in one of these separated cities, which I think is an interesting comment. So this was also picked up by some blogs. This is Michael Julia, who's a professor at the uh, University of Calgary in Alberta. Um, just again, recapping what we talked about, which was, which was quite nice. So sort of starting that discussion online in the virtual world in North America and the DHA community. But really, I think what I'd like to get at right, and start to talk about is the, the sense of overlapping associations that we all hold in, in terms of these communities. So everyone's university up here, but I forgot for in these uh, parentheses if that happens. Um, and so we're, we all have these institutional associations, but at the same time, we have, uh, let's see, let's go right. there we go. We have associations with research centers, with departments, with institutes, as I was just chatting with some folks about. So in as much as everybody involved in that panel is associated with a particular institution, we're also associated with particular labs, especially. Um, labs that exist in space, and, and that matters, and that's sort of what I'm going to talk about today. So this is lifted from uh, an article by Kathleen Fitzpatrick. So I'd like to, to back out and focus on what, what does it mean to talk about space in the digital humanities? And I think we could start getting at that by looking at the way that Kathleen, writing in 2011, defined Digital humanities. She sort of made up this definition a nexus of fields within which scholars use computing technologies to investigate the kinds of questions that are traditional in the humanities, or as is more true of my own work, ask traditional kinds of humanities oriented questions about computing technologies. It's probably very recognizable in some form to everyone in this room. What she goes on to say, though, is that there's a specific history to that term. Um, so she moves to historicize it, to give it a genealogy. That article she references is actually a great one. It's called What is DH? What's it doing in the English departments? And then Matt Kirschenbaum uh, goes through and talks about the history of the term digital humanities, which is a very particular response to a particular set of historical circumstances surrounding especially the publication of the two Blackwell companions to digital humanities on the one hand and digital literary studies on the other. They had an email debate about what they should call those. Uh, should it be a companion to humanities computing? Should it be a companion to digitized scholarship? Digitized humanities, I think, was the one of the other ones. Um, all of which is to say that it's wrapped up in publication times, it's wrapped up in marketing, it's wrapped up in politics, um, and we can track it through emails and through paper and through documents, uh, which is how I prefer to look at things. I always try to historicize. So we have a documentary history of this term, uh, material history. Which we can track, in which we can track the material production of abstract categories like disciplines, uh, departments, and schools and institutes and that kind of thing. So I'd like to bring some of that sensibility to the spaces of DH work and more broadly to digital scholarship in general. More and more, uh, I like to use digital scholarship rather than digital humanities, especially as we ostensibly try to become more transdisciplinary and talk to our colleagues. Um, Scholarship also has, especially for those people that are looking these types of work, this type of work in libraries, um, it has a much nicer ring to it and a more approachable feel. Um, but this, this shift in how we might think about the embodied and inhabited spaces that undergird intellectual work has been made before. This article uh, is by Liz Walsh, and it's called Reading Rooms, Building a National Archive of Digital Spaces and Physical Places. Uh, it's from 2004. Uh, she goes in this article and draws direct parallels and distinctions between the designs of digital materials, especially digital archives and virtual space, 
um, and the physical buildings that they come out of, uh, that they're important. And so this quote gets at that, that the spirit of a place. Is that evident in, in virtual work? And if it is, what, what can we learn from that? How do we learn to tease that out? One of the things she talks about is the, the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, in France. And she has just this wonderful quote um, about the virtual library versus the physical library. She says, the, the, the liberal ideals of anonymity and open access, the physical space, despite being having anonymity and open access online, the physical space is one of the most heavily surveilled research libraries in the world. And its users must pass through high-tech security turnstiles and attract with smart library cards. These cards have a chip, they have a photograph, and they have a magnetic strip. Um, when you, you take your card and you check in, I've never been to, to the in France, but it sounds like a more harrowing experience in the British Library. But you take this card and you check in, and it reserves you a seat number, and that seat number is your identity for your time in the library. You request things from your seat using your card. You don't have a name, you never talk to a person. It all takes place using your ID card and your seat number, which I think is a really fascinating turn of events. Everything happens through the computer. And I love this picture. This is this is the Bibliothèque Nationale in France, and it's it's just <laughs> stupendously ridiculous. I mean, they, they designed it to look like an open book, apparently. So it has four towers on each end, and then a subterranean sort of cavern here that goes down four stories in the middle. And the reading rooms are located around the outside of the sunken forest. And those green, that green is trees. There's a forest sunk three stories below the city streets. Um, so Liz kind of goes on to talk about, she says, you know, readers in the upper public reading rooms are constantly reminded that there are materials that are forbidden to them because you can't go into the towers. The towers are stacks and offices, and you read underground, <laughs> um, which is you know, very funny. She, she says, of course, prohibitions on the act of reading are nothing new to the ideology of the French bibliographical activity. We're silent here. This is one of the reasons I, I put this in. Um, as Robert Darwin has pointed out in his work on the forbidden bestsellers of the pre-revolutionary France, um, the relationship between royal authority, official scrutiny, and copyright deposit has been well documented by Darwin. And as the pain, this is one of my, my favorite quotes when looking at this building, especially, as the BNF has progressed from royal library to revolutionary library to imperial library to national library, its history has been marked by attempts to monitor the reading of the wider public as well. So, I mean, we take a look at this, which is the National Library of France, and it's really hard not to think of uh, things like Le Corbusier's vision of urban life and building these, these anonymous towers and the planned city of tomorrow that will house billions of people um, as they, they show up to work every morning. It's just another view. I mean, this, this, is, this is the Bibliothèque Nationale. What does that mean? Especially in the context of recent history, when we have the, the bad news of major French cities, this sort of ring of towers outside of the urban core, where oftentimes the, the sort of the newly immigrated, the poor, end up, they just get shoved out of the urban center, and it's also a center of rights. Like, there's, there's this entire rhetoric of cleaning out the van news. And so, I mean, what does it mean in a country where this is the site of riots not even five years ago, to have a national library that looks exactly like that? That's the kind of question I want to get at today. So we're going to flip over now to the British, who also happened to build a big new library in the last 30 years. Um, Colin, Colin St. John Wilson is the architect. He sort of looked at the BNF and decided that that's exactly what he didn't want to do. And so he tried to design the British Library in the reverse of that. Um, whether he succeeded, I don't know. I've been there. It seems you also order things through computer terminals. It's very reminiscent of the descriptions of this rights at the, the French National Library. It's the same anchor station in the background, it's a big square. I mean, it's, it's a huge building, it's a huge government building. Uh, but it's also a building with a history. This is a ground plan of the British Museum from, I think, it has to be between 1834 and 1855. Um, and so this is the courtyard, four wings, store books. Um, now they're the body of the museum collections. But this is, this is a space that's changed. So originally there was a giant courtyard in the middle. I've rotated this in order to have the orientation straight. And then they built a big reading room. Like, that wasn't there when they originally built the British Museum and Library. They just put the books wherever they could. And then as technology changed and as the rate of printing picked up, 
to such an extent that they didn't know what to do with all these books, they decided to fill in the courtyard and they built the reading room that is now the British Library reading room, um, not at the British Library. <laughs> And that was a technological marvel in its day. It was very associated with the leader of the British Library, uh, Antonio Panizzi, who did a lot to revolutionize things. It's called the Iron Library. It's built of iron. It's extremely impressive. It's seen as fireproof. And so around the reading room, they put books. They had the stacks around the middle. Which is during the important thing about that is it's a direct result of not knowing what to do with this mass of printed material they were getting. Their response to technological change and information overload was to build a giant iron room in the space they already controlled and then have people go there. Which of course is not stable and now it's changed and the British Library moved to their new complex. They put a really cool sort of latticework roof over the entire courtyard. And now the British Museum Reading Room is still a reading room, but I think the only thing in it is the British Library catalog of printed books and some encyclopedias, um, which take up the, the British. I do some research on the catalog of printed books, and it is stupendous in its size. It's 300 volumes um, before they started putting it all online in the 70s and 80s. Um, and that's one of the only things in there. So you can go there, but it's a historical relic now. The role of that space has changed as the collections kept growing, um, which I think is pretty but also fascinating. So a lot of the, the, the work in this presentation and the work to think about digital humanity spaces and spaces of intellectual activity more generally is coming out of library studies. Um, humanists are very good at critiquing things like space and maps and even architecture, I would say. But in terms of actually knowing and thinking specifically about how to design something from the ground up, I think, my, my, okay, Jason, I keep wandering around. Um, in terms of designing things from the ground up, this is what librarians have thought about for a long, long time because they deal with the nuts and bolts of like, well, how big do the book cards need to be? Where will people sit in these kinds of things? Um, so I just love this, this description of success, and this article is actually sort of attacking this and trying to figure out how do we, how do we actually get metrics on library success. But the quote, the building is full of students who seem pleased with the space and accoutrements. The renovated library has become a great space to study, to socialize, and to work collaboratively. And to me, that just, that sounds like a great definition, period, of where intellectual work should happen. And I think that it's a good, sort of lodestone about what the spaces of digital scholarship might look like. I think that's, that's as good a definition as any. So I'm going to talk about two or three examples and then end up talking about the ETCL where I work before, so we're zooming back out and hopefully we can have some good discussion. So first we have the, the Hump Library at North Carolina State uh, University, which is in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's from my original neck of the woods. It's very hot. Um, and there's a lot of money there. It's the center of a particularly economically vibrant region of center of biotech right now. But this is it. It's very new, as you can probably tell by the architecture. Um, it looks like a spaceship. And the inside is even more impressive. It, this, this is how the whole thing is. I kept walking around thinking I was in uh, an exploding space station from 2001, Space Odyssey. I kept expecting like Russians to come up and start trying to buy new drinks. Um, sorry, that's a very particular reference to that scene. <laughs> this is uh, their immersive projector room. It's kind of hard to see because I stole this image from online, but they're sitting around sort of a U-shaped table, and all around, on three sides, is a projector screen with lights and immersive sound system um, and the works. And the project they're actually displaying is called the St. Paul's Cross Project. It's fantastic. It's well worth looking at. This, though this is the yard of St. Paul's Cathedral before old St. Paul's burned down. This is the very corner of the cathedral right here. This is the pulpit where John Dunn would speak his sermons from. So what they've done is they've recreated this based on maps, based on uh, the booksellers who we have records of being in the square. And then beyond that, they've worked with a bunch of sound engineers and archaeologists and these kinds of folks to actually recreate the soundscape of it. So you go in and you sit down in the middle of this room and you see the visual space outlaid before you can click on John Dunn's, one of his sermons, and then click on the soundscape beyond that. And it goes a long way towards recreating what that might have been like. And that space is just completely lost in mean, the face of the city, regardless of the cathedral having burned down, because it's very different now, to put it mildly. They also have a games room where they, this is about um, 
five tall and 15 wide where they can do games research. It's touch screen activated, so when we have a conference there, one of um, our researchers works with a sort of uh, avant-garde interface to try to work with large data sets, and he just threw it up, and for the first time, you can actually go up and do the like minority report thing mm -hmm. on the screen, uh, which looked really cool, but also made his application kind of much more useful because it's dealing with such large data sets. It's actually really hard to get at on a small computer screen. But beyond the whiz bang techno stuff, they have really simple things like light bulbs in every, room. every study room. The walls are white bulbs. They're not mounted. They're the walls, um, and they put markers on all the tables that in the study rooms. They're just provided. And beyond that, even the tables that are sort of down in this area, not those ones in particular, but they have these pods of study tables for individual workspaces that you can pull together and recombine that are all just whiteboards. So you can work on them, work on the laptop and stuff, but then you can also just start writing on the tables. And then again, they screw markers around, kind of not subtly trying to get you to write on things. Um, and it's just remarkable. I mean, that seems that's one of those very simple ideas, design ideas, that could do a lot, you know? That's just the help desk. Like, the whole place looks like this. It's absurd. Uh, in a kind of wonderful way. They gave us a tour of how we didn't want to work there. It's in the middle of North Carolina, unfortunately. Which we know anything about U.S. politics is a frog here yet. Um, I also want to mention the, the Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities, which is a uh, an organization that any of you might be familiar with, Neil, I actually realized is speaking, the director of this institute is speaking as a keynote for <laughs> Digital Humanities Australasia uh, next week, which I didn't realize until now. So they're, they're located about 40 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. at a major research university. And this is their essentially DH center. And they went through a big redesign about three years ago. And what I think is important about this space is that they, they combine a lot of different functions. They combine display, like artifacts, these kinds of things. Excuse me. Especially electronic literature. Uh, they have a space for socializing. They have lab space, which for students to use over here. And a few more pictures of this. And then they have individual uh, lab spaces for faculty and members of the institute. They also have a kitchen, which is quite nice for those events. Uh, so that's just some of the computer workstations in the lab. Faculty workstations. I mean, in some ways, this stuff is not exciting. But in other ways, it's exactly what we need to be thinking about to have effective teams and effective sort of intellectual fervor, uh, for lack of a better word. That's a little when I get to ETCL in just a moment. You will see the contrast with some of the spaces I'm showing you and sort of the work that we did. This is their display. They have like lots of old Apple computers. This is a floppy disk, which for scale, I hope that is sort of apparent. It's about the size of this monitor. Um, and it looks like a three and a half inch floppy that happens to be a foot and a half tall. Um, it's very incredible. And they have a lot of uh, interactive literature type stuff, a lot of first editions from the late 80s of electronic, uh, very important electronic literature. And the last, uh, last center I want to talk about before we get to the ETCL is the CMDC, which is the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program and Center at Washington State University uh, in Vancouver, Washington, not to be confused with Vancouver, British Columbia, which is right outside of Portland, Oregon. So it's sort of a small blue collar town that went through the loss of its industry in the 70s and 80s. This has happened all over North America. Um, and this has sort of pulled, been pulled into the orbit of Portland, which is a real creative hub. And this, this program is interesting. It's run by Dean Greenberg, who actually was on the version of this panel at uh, the Rocky Mountain Language Association. So they have a couple different spaces, but I wanted to focus on this one first of all. This is their lab space, this is their classroom space. So people that enter this concentration uh, focus a lot on digital media and editing, um, like on building editions, on physical fabrication, on virtual reality, um, media production, on actually going out into the community and doing things with technology, with people that have never had someone from the university come out and say, we're going to do a project on you know, interviewing you on the timber trade. So southeastern uh, Oregon, like that's that's the kind of things that they're doing using all this technology. But their space is just phenomenal. Um, they have a balcony, which is being looked over right now. All the desks are movable. You can probably tell they're separated. Um, they all have desktops, but most people do that these days, just bring a laptop and plop it down. It's modular and it's flexible. 
There's another view of that. And then this, you can see all these things hanging down from the ceilings. These are power and Ethernet cables. So they come down off these racks that they pull down and plug into these sort of towers that stand in the middle of these pods. And that's what everything plugs into. So you can just, there are Ethernet cables, and you can just pull them out and plug them into your laptop and you bring it over there. Or you can change it around completely, which they do for different events and things like that. I just think it's, they, like, they thought this renovation through very clearly. This is where those pictures down, looking down were taken from. They have a meeting space and a lounge space, and this is where the director sits in her tiny wooden desk over here that she really likes. Their library is actually right behind where this picture was taken. They have probably one of the best digital humanities and even new media studies libraries I've ever seen in one place, including in my institutional library. Um, she's a very active member. But this is, you know, they store books here. The team works there um, in terms of faculty and students. And they have meetings there. I mean, it's a flight and everything is on wheels. Everything is on wheels everywhere. That, that, that so these are just some of the, the projects that they do. Um, I mean, they're all they're very involved with local uh, new media art creation. So they have a gallery space downtown where they mount these sort of crazy exhibits that are interactive, and you like walk up and talk to it, and it will think about something and respond to you, and then do a visualization of your conversation and things like that. They've digitized manuscripts. They have a traveling uh, motion tracking virtual environment. The, the Move Lab is a projection space where they design, among other things, an app that allows you to work with molecules. So it's designed for prime for middle and high school science students to come in, and they sort of put their hands on a servo mechanism, and then you go into the visualization and try to like pull apart molecules, then you learn about the structures of sort of complex uh, things it's like the water one is incredibly fun. Like you start taking apart water. And if you take out hydrogens, then like it stays water, but it's sort of the bonds between the other ones get more, more firm. But it's giving you feedback the whole time you're doing this. So if you're pulling hydrogen out of the, the water molecule, it's actually pulling and resisting because it doesn't want it doesn't want to be separated. Then you heat it up, and it's easier to separate. Like really, sort of crazy things like that. That's just a sample of what the CNBC is doing. And finally, we get to, to my lab, uh, the Electronic Textual Cultures Lab at the University of Victoria. This is us. We're in a hallway. A uh, hallway in the basement, I should say. Um, which I think bothers me probably more than anyone else in the lab because I have actually been to a lot of digital humanities research spaces now. And then I come back and it's just, it's an interesting contrast because we, we do so much, some of which I'll comment on a little bit, and we do it out of this very strange space. I don't know if you can see, but those are the windows we have. They sort of are in one of these pits of like flower beds, and in the summer, uh, it gets, or in the winter, it gets a bit, a bit dark. <laughs> um, so that's from one end, we, and, and we are actually in a hallway. This, one has, this is a space that's been subdivided of the bottom floor of the Humanities Building into our lab, um, the Humanities Media and Computing Center, which is kind of like a, a, a room full of adjacents, as I understand. They sort of freelance project development in the digital humanities uh, based on sort of a piecemeal grant funding and baseline from the university funding model. And then a computer related language learning center uh, that's primarily integrated by French and Spanish as well as languages department. So this wall is new because they put it up to put us in it. <laughs> this is just from the other side. It's my colleague Elisa at the front and my former colleague Laura at the back. And this is a sun lamp because it gets very dark in British Columbia uh, during the winter. So we have a lamp in the basement to keep us safe. Um, we have a little meeting room. And recently, um, Lynn Siemens, who is a member of the Inc. Our research group, has been so she, she's kind of a consultant and kind of a researcher. She, she researches the organization as a whole and publishes in public administration journals and these kinds of things about how a large digitally facilitated team of 70 different academics divided into three or four research clusters actually does anything and how it gets done. So she talked us into, as part of a project, putting in a Skype wall. So this is our little hallway. And then we have some, because we have too many people, um, they're in another office, so we put in a webcam that's always on. 
to let us watch each other. <laughs> the idea was originally to actually have it uh, visual and audio, and so we could talk across the lab and try to make it one cohesive community. Um, but people got very tired of the audio and turned it off. And so it's just silent video now, which I think I, I think kind of defeats the purpose of doing such an experiment. But uh, I was not there when that decision was made. So that's my colleague Aaron in another office. And then this is his office, and we have a camera too. And it's just always a lot. We log in every day when we get there. Um, and, and kind of wave for each other's uh, attention. So that's kind of our space. And despite being in the hallway, we do a lot. Um, and so I'm just going to sort of run through some of the stuff we do real quick. So this is that flyer from our ground. It's actually today. Is this today? Is it the 13th year? I'm getting confused. Uh, excellent. So Joel is a PhD student from the history department who comes to a lot of our events. And he's presenting today um, on, on Japanese. He does Japanese history stuff. So he's doing a big digital project with the island of Hokkaido sort of tracking some of the historical narratives. Uh, this happens once a month or so, when people bring their lunch, we hang out, there's a 20, 30 minute talk, and then question time, so people sort of crunch away on carrots. We also have uh, Nuts and Bolts, a DH discussion series, which is oriented heavily towards uh, actually doing digital scholarship, so it's things like project management, design, uh, this one's about user testing, so these three folks are all from the University of British Columbia across the street, so we're going to probably take a ferry, which takes three or four hours to come over. And so we, that happens about every month and a half when we talk about concrete projects and how we do projects. And then recently we were involved in uh, Idea Fest, which is this thing run out of the library, meant to showcase current research essentially, but we in our, I actually planned this in the 19th Pacific because I was flying here. <laughs> uh, it, our presentation drew exclusively on postdoc, postdoctoral fellows in the lab, and it was just a chance for them to showcase their research. So each one of them did a, are you guys familiar with the Pecha Kucha format of presentations? It's, it's uh, 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide, with the slides automatically going behind you, so you have no control over your presentation and you just present for 6 minutes and 20 seconds, and then you're done. It's very effective for time management, uh, because once your slides stop, if people will keep talking, it can be very awkward very quickly. Um, so they did a presentation on that. One of them was talking about textual studies in Ulysses. Um, one of them was talking about actually doing some topic modeling using Mallet with uh, Moby Dick fan fiction, which I really wanted to see, because he was actually sort of looking at the stylistics of fan fiction versus the original novel. And like some of his results are not particularly surprising. I mean, the vocabulary in Moby Dick is in fact richer than the vocabulary in Moby Dick fan fiction. Um, but, you know, these are, these are the sort of baby steps of actually getting in and generating research questions. We also had two academics from Montreal come through who are both associated with some other projects uh, presenting out the humanities, this initiative called For Humanities, kind of uh, a move to justify and popularize the humanities as something that actually matters uh, and like, why it's relevant to folks. Uh, and of course we run the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, which is probably the largest digital humanities training experience now available. I think our, <coughs> this year we're over 500 people registered. Um, and that's all run out of our little hallway. Um, all the grant writing gets done there. And we're in fact, uh, uh, and this so we'll see if it works. There we go. This is our logo. <laughs> it's supposed to be an androgynous uh, person joining the digital and humanities. It's about 10 years old. We're in the market for a redesign. So we've gotten uh, Dr. Wu and a Cylon from Bob Star Galactica. And our current front runner up is a circle of hearts. So if you guys have any idea or don't need designers, we're obviously hard enough. Um, all of which brings me to a sort of a, a, a place where what, what is the space of digital research look like? I mean, I've just run through three or four examples, including the one that sort of I spent all my time in the basement. Um, and, and I really hope we can have a conversation about what you all hope it can look like here, and maybe drawing on some other examples. But does it look like massive visualization walls? This is Lev Manovich's um, visualization wall. I don't know how to put it. I think, is it, uh, is it, is it NYU? Do you know 
It's, yeah, he, he, he just does giant visualizations. His last project was on selfies. He had, he like, aggregated a billion selfies, like images he take himself. And then was like, essentially doing stylistic analysis of them, being like, oh, most people look they were the right side. Um, it was a big hit in the Atlantic uh, magazine online. But like, is this what digital scholarship means in the next five to 10 years? Large visualization walls? Is it sort of flex space that has, again, huge screens, which seem to be a recurring theme, but also mobile workstations? Um, it's obviously wireless because everybody's on wireless. Is there a coffee machine? Uh, this is the debate that we've had at UVic about one of our labs um, is uh, in a building where they don't have a, a kitchen connection in the lab space. So they have to go and share the kitchen with the school of business. And the school of business gets extremely territorial about things and won't let them use the kitchen. Like, they seem like really quotidian things, but they really matter. Like, a research lab without coffee might as well you know, shut down. Um, or is it a space that is unborn to anything? This is my colleague Aaron, who the other, the other Skype wall end, and they're doing a physical fabrication and physical computing workshop taught by one of our faculty members. And so they just brought some power strips and set up a space and went from there. Uh, so it's mobile, but it's tied to particular things that make a space worthwhile or workable to use. So I mean, I guess the, the thing I want to end up on, and I've spoken for longer than I intended to, but is that just this sort of simple point that space can't help but matter. This is uh, actually an engraving of Parameta from 1812 by Philip Slander, who I found this on Wikipedia. Um, and I learned also from Wikipedia. And that parameter is located where it is because it's the furthest navigable point on the river from Sydney Harbor, um, as well as having fresh water where they can grow crops. That's the entire reason the city exists, because they need food, and this is where they ended up. I mean, space space matters to what we do. Uh, history can't help but shape. This is the the female orphans hospital. I mean, that was that was it in like eighteen sixty. Yeah, see you know. <laughs> I was within 10 years. <laughs> um, and this is it today. I mean, we need to figure out how to tease out the implications of being in a building that was built in 1812. Is it from 1812? It's in my career. I was floating my way through all these things. <laughs> um, and it's well, the so but, I mean, what does it mean to, if, we, if we're trying to locate a digital research lab in a complex of buildings maybe in the early 19th century, that's going to matter. Jason showed me to the washroom, and the washrooms in the humanities building are on completely opposite sides of the building. Like, it's, it's symmetrical, but why is it symmetrical? What does that mean? These are the things that I get really interested in. Um, so I think we need to keep one eye on the politics of this, and you know, going back to like, the, the tech national, and, like a post apocalyptic Judge Dredd type of wasteland. Um, and when I'm pragmatics, you know, we need power outlets and those kinds of things. And I do, I like power outlets in Australia because they have switches. It's something I've never seen before. It makes so much sense to just turn off when you're not using it. Um, so, I mean, space is urgent and space is something that people are thinking about. This is just a final quote drawn from the proposal for a digital humanities center at Princeton University, which they, of course, released to the public very splashy fashion because now they're doing digital humanities, <laughs> uh, which I find really amusing. But they, they sort of emphasize that they need space, they need a room, or they need a center or something like this. Um, an open space in which a scholar might walk in with a question about an archive, data sets, a specific problem, or a project proposal is both an immediate concern and crucial. Uh, so what does that look like? I mean, everybody says we need it. We make do with what we have. But what does it look like if we can do it from the ground up? Uh, so I'm hoping that we can just think about that and, and hopefully talk and, and draw on some of the examples that people have seen in different uh, you know, travels or around here. So that's kind of wide ranging, but uh, I really just wanted to show off some of the places that, that I've encountered and, and see, see what you guys are doing here. That's part of the reason I'm here. So thanks.